the, um, I guess the sequential part of the class, we'll start talking about the parallel part. Um, so t today is, oh, I'll, I'll make a note about some of the lectures. This one, the overview one, seems to not be on the memory card for some reason, so that one seems to be lost. Uh, this one was recorded, but the sound wasn't working for the first hour. Um, so um, the good news is that I gave a similar lecture in another class where it spanned part of it, and so I linked, it's in two parts, in V and 9, uh, or in the plus, and then the star is what we recorded, but without sound until the very end. Um, um, I'm not sure what happened. So, um, and it, this one will go up by Monday, uh, we'll do, so we're going to start in the parallel part. This will be an overview, um, an, an overview lecture. And then we'll talk about stuff in kind of a general way of thinking about algorithms in, in the parallel setting, uh, talking about some basic stuff. And the ideas here will carry over in um, some other techniques. And I'll mention in the overview how some of these other things kind of fit in. We'll have some, I have some schedule up here which fills out all the lectures we have, but there's some flexibility. Maybe we want to talk about this some of the new developments in the last couple of years. Um, so Clement, I think you're in charge of the video uh, today. I started it already, yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh. I, it's, it's mostly good, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm so sorry. So I, I can check, let's see. 10.04, that's today. Looks like it's Clement, all right. I mean, I'm not assigned to any. Hmm? Seems like I'm not assigned to any of the days. Yeah, so there, there are only so many days. So, so maybe I could have you as, there's other people who are unassigned, so in case someone doesn't show up, I can, I can call them someone. I probably should have done that. Um, Is it mandatory? What? No, no, it's not mandatory. As long as you, you did what you have signed up for, then you'll be okay. Um, I haven't gotten all of the scribe notes. I have a version of them for this, for, for this one, but they're not in the right version. I have two from this lecture. There are two groups that did this somehow. That's that's okay. And then my own notes from this lecture. Um, so it's it's recording. So are there any special rules how to record? Ah, so so I, I made a checklist of what you should be doing. Well, has it, is that microphone need to be plugged the in? The microphone needs to be plugged in and it should be turned on. Oh, if, you, okay. if you only do one or the other. Um, it probably won't work. Um, <laughs> so, so, so that may have been why the sound was missing. Um, okay, so, so after I get through the overview lecture, there'll be some flexibility, and if people have some things that they would like me to spend more or less time on, you should try and let me know, and I can, I can maybe do some, some adjustments accordingly. All right. Um, okay, so, all right, so I'll start with kind of a history of how people have thought of parallel algorithms. So, question. so, so it, it, it's, yeah, on the side there, there's a microphone. So, the, the, I think it's the first work is often attributed to Petrie, um, and so the, um, the the so the these models of parallel algorithms were they were kind of drawn using these these diagrams. And I'm not going to really explain how this worked, but really it's it's a flow chart showing different dependencies you have to do. So if you took a um, like a finite automata class, it was very, it was based in, the, in that way of thinking. Um, so back in the 60s and, um, and 70s, a lot of computer science thinking of the thinking of algorithms was thought of through um, finite automata, and so they phrased the parallel algorithms 
in that way as well. So a lot of the way people think of algorithms now is no longer through um, through finite automata, but that turns to make turns out to make a bit more sense in, in many ways when you're dealing with parallel algorithms. So we'll see how this um, how this model developed. Why would you think of algorithms through finite automata? We know that the, the, the language of expression they represent are regular expressions. Well, so, so you can, so not just finite automata, but there, there are different yeah. versions of them. But you built up yeah, that notion of computation from that. Now people generally start with, you know, something like von Neumann's model, right? Where you have a, um, where you're just working in RAM and you count the number of CPU operations. You don't think of what is computability as much as. Um, now, there, th that's not entirely true. There are some areas of, uh, of study, especially like formal verification, where these are still really the core tools and you need to really understand these things. Um, also, like programming languages, um, in, in certain aspects of those, that's, that's really important. Um, so, but it, it, you, you, can, you can look at you know, certain things like certain you can prove certain things like things are x space hard. Uh, um, you need exponential space to, to in order to do certain things. Um, but the, 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 these these tools are very low level and and not always powerful enough for everything that we want to do. Um, so th th there are also developments. Uh, um, hopefully, people know know Dijkstra's maybe from Dijkstra's algorithms. He's done he's done a lot of important things for pure science. So he kind of uh, was one of the ones who came up, or at least kind of uh, um, really popularized this notion of a mutex, where you have a variable where you you have certain restrictions on how you can access this variable, right? So if you're doing things in parallel, um, you maybe not both parts of the, the different parallel components can access the variable in the same way. And, and so in order to deal with th these things, you need to do it you need to worry about these semaphores where you have these, um, so these, where you have a data, piece of data which is locked and you have to unlock it in order to make sure that you have these sorts of parallels. Um, and so you, 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 you can do multiple things with this and, you know, I, I don't know if, if any of you have, if you still are taught this in your operating systems class, um, you know, I, I always found these sorts of things extremely painful. Um, there's 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 a lot of you know a lot of special cases or hard cases you have to worry about and it's it's a lot of work if you want to do something parallel you had you I thought you had to deal with all these things um, okay so um, okay and, and I mean for for certain these things are still important but most people um, myself included don't want to have to deal with you know wor worrying about these sorts of low level details. Okay, so um, other, um, some other important developments were, um, th th these are more popular um, from like, uh, like an architecture, but the idea is, you know, so, so this Omdel's law really comes from architecture where you have part of some sort of program or operation that you're doing, and you can break it into parts. This white part is the part that you can parallelize somehow, and that can tell you how. And this red part is the part that you can't. And you said, well, you know, maybe not paralyzed, but maybe I want to speed up. I can speed up this part, but I can't. This part I'm not going to speed up. How much of the whole program can I speed up? And the idea is, if there's an if there's an alpha fraction which you can't paralyze, the red part, you're not going to get more of a speed up than a one over alpha speed. And that's because if you squeeze these white parts as much as possible, you made the time which is kind of the horizontal axis here, faster and faster, you're still gonna have to deal with the red parts the same. Right, so you can't speed that up. And so now, when you look at parallel algorithms, um, so then there's Gustafson's law, which is kind of a, a, a different version of this, where you still have this alpha fraction not parallelized, but you now say, I have P parallel processors. So now, how much can I speed up the same computation where some part I can parallelize, the alpha fraction I can't. What's the maximum speed up I could possibly get? And so it's gonna be, basically you get a speed up of P minus some term that depends on alpha. Basically, the part that can be parallelized, you can speed up by a factor of P, because you can do it um, on P different processors at once, 
But the red part, you can't. You can't parallelize that. And so this gives kind of some very, uh, uh, kind of a, a very high level view on what you can accomplish with parallelism. Uh, basically, you want to get something close to a factor of p speed up if you have p processors. And that's kind of going to be the goal. But there's going to be part that you can't speed up. And, and there's also going to be more, and so it's not ever this quite this simple. You're always going to have a few extra terms in addition to the, the part that you can't speed up. So, so we'll see we'll, we'll see how this works in some specific examples. Okay. Um, so, so another important kind of a concept in parallel algorithms was from Leslie Lamport, and it's the idea of uh, of these logical clocks. You want to keep kind of um, things in the right order, um, but maintaining the exact clock is very very difficult because of you know you, you can't keep time exactly, um, but you. Like you don't really need the notion of clock, you need the notion of that, that you have a partial order in the order the operation has to do. So, okay, well, let me explain what this diagram is supposed to mean. Your, your algorithm needs to do many things in order to get to this goal, and it has to start, right? You have to compute some sub part of the algorithm, and you have to compute this other part, and then you take the outputs and you do other things with them and you eventually you combine them together. You need to draw this sort of, this DAG of your algorithm. Um, and if you draw this, you can't accomplish this part until you've done this part here, right? Um, and you can't do this until you've done this. So this kind of gives you a notion of ordering. And so you can parallelize this, you can cut across, and these two parallel, two processors can work on these two aspects at the same time, but you can't go ahead and do this until you've also done this this step as well, so you you can't uh, there, it enforces some constraints on your on your algorithm, um, and this seems very abstract, but we'll make this more and more concrete. Um, so, for instance, if you have a parallel algorithm, it can do these two red things in parallel, uh, but then essentially this one has to wait, right? It can't go and do this one, but that other one can split and do these two things in parallel. Right? And so then it can do these two in parallel, and finally the last one, um, it's, it, you can't parallelize it. But it, at all points, you always had two ways parallels, except for the, the start. Uh, so assuming each circle of work takes about the same amount of time to do, we would be unable to employ more than two processors on this program. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's correct. Um, and in some cases, only one. Right, so you, in some parts, you can't parallelize at all, the first and the last. Yeah, so these last things do not need to be the same amount of time. They're just logical units of things that you have to do one before the other. Right. right. So think of this as calling some function which goes and does something it needs to return. Right. Um, um, so, 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 so the, this, the, the view you know, this high level view of viewing this as a, as a DAG, this kind of dates back to this Petrie's view of things, which was, the Petrie's view was much more even, uh, was more primitive than this. This is much more abstract, but this kind of did not have the right, the full view of how to kind of describe full algorithms. Um, you know, um, back when Lamport um, first proposed this. But it kind of highlights some of the, the, the nuances of some of the challenges which would come up um, kind of later on. And this, these ideas would be built upon. Um, so it, it eventually, and I, I don't know if there's one single person to, to attribute this to, but this is, you know, um, the, the, these are the view of things you can get out of this, um, this DAG model of computation. Right, so I said some of this on the previous slide, but um, you know, the just to spell it out again, the, the each component represents some chunk of things that can be done on a single processor, independent of everything else. Given it has all of its inputs, um, and the directed edges means that you have to do the things directed into it before you operate on that. But once you do that, you can you can do that independently of what else is, is going on. And then the longest path in the DAG. You know, essentially represents the total amount of parallel time gain for the algorithm. Okay, so um, 
so, so often, to simplify this, people will ignore um, the number of processors that you have. You can assume that you have enough processors. So, so like assume that you're Google and you have um, hundreds of thousands of nodes you could use if you could, if you could parallelize something. I don't know if there's hundreds of thousands, but it's at least, at least tens of thousands. Um, I would, it, might, it could easily be, a, it's probably as hundred thousand. But, um, so, so, uh, the, um, so, 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 <laughs> this longest path, if you have a, a time you need to go through each of these nodes, the longest path through these nodes says how long it, it must take to complete this, no matter how many parallel processors you have. Um, and the width of the DAG, uh, the how many things across, essentially gives a, um, it, it indicates the number of processors that can be used at once. Um, so, you know, if you have, the width is no more than, than three. Now the width here is, is three in this case. I means that if I had more than three processors, it's n n never going to be useful. Right now, it turns out I can't use. I, I never need more than two because of how it's structured layout. So this is a this just looking at the DAG. It's hard to kind of get a complete understanding, but it's usually this is a good enough representation. So the, the width is if you could say a cut through the graph where everything above pointed to the cut and everything below pointed out from the cut. How many nodes can you go through in the cut? That's that's the way. There's some more technical ways of um, defining this, or more careful ways. But and it kind of gives an upper bound. So this will kind of give you like a rule of thumb of of what you can use. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Is it possible for the graph to have cycles in it if there's um, some portion of the job that's going to have to be repeated? A large number of times, like if we were doing a big map reduce, and we don't know in advance how many times we're going to have to iterate. Yeah. So, um, the <laughs> this is a logical representation. You may not spell, you may not write this out, but to analyze it, you it has to be a DAG. There can't be any cycles because you need to always go forward. Now, if you try and compress the representation so you can make it more understandable um, for yourself. So you can see what's going on. You might draw it with some cycles to try and think about, but you might also confuse yourself. Um, th this should be a directed acyclic graph, so no cycles. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to answer to that. Okay. So. Okay. Um, okay. So so here's kind of a very simple um, way of doing this. So. Not like 2011, 900,000 servers. Um, 900. 900,000. Okay, so, so so the question is how many CPUs? It's even more, right? Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, That's an estimate. Yeah. As, as, I, I don't think Google releases this, right? Yeah, no. So, so it's an estimate. Yeah, yeah. Based on the power usage. <laughs> yeah, so if Google really, really wanted to, to do something in parallel, which they, they, I don't think they can have enough data where they can actually want to, want to do that. But, um, well, I don't know. We'll maybe we'll come back and answer that later in class. Probably today is more than one million. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, okay. So um, so here's an example, a very simple example of computation. We want to add up a set of numbers. Okay. Um, so y you think of each of the numbers being in one of these locations, and then an operation is to grab a number a one grab a number A2 and add them together. That's happened at one of these nodes. And then you can, you can decompose this operation into these three levels, or maybe it's kind of only, only two levels, depending on how you count these inputs, right? Um, and um, so, so uh, I, I can't really compute this sum of all of them until I have these two, two partial sums, right? Um, so if, I, and I'm really doing three operations here. I'm doing three, three additions. Um, so it, would, it takes only parallel time of two here, this step and this step. But if I did it sequentially, it would take three steps. Um, and as, you, as you're adding n numbers together, it's going to take up on log n parallel steps. And you're going to be able to get 
um, parallel utilization in one step of, of n over 2. Right, so you're going to have you know a large parallel utilization, but you're still you need log n parallel steps. Um, and we'll we'll see we'll go through some similar examples in more details I think in the in probably in the next next Wednesday's lecture, but it's slightly more complicated than this. Just see how to think about this. Um, okay, so this is kind of a view of the DAG representation. You want to take whatever your program is, and you need to figure out how to break it into a DAG for two reasons. One to kind of get your estimate of how many parallel, uh, how many processors you can use and also how long it will take. And also when you program it, you need to somehow tell the, you know, t t tell your many parallel processors how to split things up. You need to somehow come up with some sort of representation. Uh, do you have static analyzers which will go through the code and uh, which will decide uh, this kind of graph? Yeah, so, so like in simple cases, there are a lot of compilers and things that can actually do some of this work. Um, so for, for very well-known things like the sum of a bunch of numbers, this is, is known how to do it. And, and compilers for parallel things will take care of this work. Um, for, for other things, you, you know, it, the compiler might not be able to figure it out, and you want to know how to do it. So you may want to... Give, at least give the compiler some hints. So in order to give it some hints, you need to understand what is the right way to split this, this computation into pieces. Um, okay, so, um, so, so this was all good, but it was, you know, for more complicated things, this became harder to work with. Um, so then the, the next kind of uh, big, big uh, change in how people thought of this was in a model uh, um, that's often called um, PRAM or the shared memory model, where the idea is that there's one memory and there's a bunch of there are P CPUs and each CPU can access and do whatever to the memory. Right? They thought this was a nice um, way of um, of abstracting this out, and um, and so. Then each of these uh, these operations, like plus minus times, you know, bit shift and stuff, take a constant amount of time. Um, so, the, but you know, this is not very realizable. You know, just this purely abstract view in hardware. Um, and what if you're trying to one person's one processor is trying to read from something while another one is, is trying to write to it, right? Um, what happens if the write happens right before or right after the read is might change the output. Um, so you have to put these different sorts of restrictions on you. There's the, the CREW, they can, two processors can read at the same time, but only one is allowed to write. There's some sort of, um, um, like a mutex or something on that piece of information, so only one processor is allowed to write to it. Um, um, it there's also like the, there's other models where you can concurrently read and concurrently write to some operation. And you can write, so um, this one is harder to implement in hardware, right? So there are some hardware that does allow you to write code that will allow different processors to concurrently read and write from the same object. But when you, you may have issues where if you design your algorithm wrong, it's going to not have consistent answers. So you need to be careful how you are designing your algorithm, right? If you're concurrently writing to something, it may be something where you're only incrementing that value. If you only increment it, it doesn't matter the order so much. At the end of the day, you're going to go read it, but not till all the increments are done. Um, so, uh, so, and you need to have some sort of uh, check to make sure all the increments are done. You need to write that into your code. Um, so as opposed to have the hardware checking it for you. Um, so th th this one, in theory, you can, you can write stuff, uh, write algorithms sometimes that look to be faster, but they're much harder to actually implement in a way that you're guaranteed to get the right result. Um, and it's harder to do in hardware. So the hardware that allows you to do this is often slower than the hardware that would allow, say, can current read but exclusive write, or even exclusive read and exclusive write. This would essentially be that the memory was split up into chunks and each processor had a chunk of the memory. Um, it's slightly different because 
there's, there's another model I'll talk about, which is exactly that. Um, but then you need to send stuff from one CPU to the other. Here, the, the memory is in place, and you just change who, is a, who has control over the memory. Um, and so it depends what is right. It depends on your actual, that, what it was the right level of architecture. So the more, the more exclusions you have on what the processors can do, the faster the hardware can be implemented. Um, but the harder it is to, um, the slower the algorithms will be, um, you know, the number of steps that they'll need to take. But also, it's often the, the if you ignore the part of, uh, of changing the exclusions, the, the code is, there are less details you have to, to worry about in some sense in writing. Okay, so, but it turns out that, the, I mean, these models are used some places. Um, but th this is not really often how your data is distributed. People thought, th this, was, this was in 1978, right? So there wasn't a whole lot of parallel architecture back then. There were some specialized machines, but it's not like today where most laptops have probably four CPUs in them, right? Or maybe more than that, at least two. That, that was not the common case. This was for much more specialized machines. And people thought about how can you implement these different versions of this. Um, so th so th this turned out not to be the, there's some people who will argue with me about this probably, but th this is not the model people think about parallel programs anymore. Um, the, but yeah. isn't it effectively the model that most laptops use? Because any of the four cores can, is ultimately ac accessing the same RAM. I think I think I yeah. think that the first and the third are completely are completely okay for nowadays architectures. So the but first and the third. So so the thing is, most laptops will have like four cores, and so you get a speed up of four. Yeah, it's 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 good, but it's not. Um, it, it, it's it, it's not a huge improvement. You you want to really think about when you have like um, like one hundred processors. And when you have 100 processors, your architecture does not look like this. There's not a shared memory. Yeah. The different processors, there, there'll be groups of processors which each have their own memory. There may be a machine, um, uh, like there may be a bunch of machines, you know, there are 900,000 machines at Google. Each machine may have, uh, or, <laughs> don't okay. quote me. Don't quote, I there, just, there, I just there read. are roughly a million machines at Google, give or take a factor of 10. Um, and, and each machine may have four cores, right? But the machines each have their own RAM, their own disk probably, you know, their own sort of memory. So they don't really have the shared memory among all of those machines. So you're not gonna get the sorts of parallelism you get where you don't have to send the data from one machine to the other are not gonna be realized. So this, so this is not, so, you know, th this model does occur in some architectures, but th this is not the most popular model to study nowadays for really massive data. Um, yeah. Uh, CRCW, uh, is the most, the more complicated algorithm, but EREW will take longer time to, to get run. Yeah, for, if you look at the algorithm, the analysis of the algorithms, right? Uh, in, now, what happens actual in practice is, is a different thing, right? There are more trade-offs than just counting the number of CPU cycles. You're counting the number of operations you do. These, the, the, in theory, the algorithms here should be as faster because they have less restrictions on the algorithms. But, you know, the, 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 this is a theoretical point of view, which is, you know, is you shouldn't always trust what you read and do. Right, so, so, you know, this is me saying this. My, my background is actually in theory and algorithms, and I don't trust a lot of theory if it's written under the wrong model of computation. And so this is not, you know, th this is very hard to realize in, in hardware. So, 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 so you could see things that get a better algorithmic runtime using this model, but in practice, they're not going to run as fast. Right? And there's a reason why. It's, it has to do with the architecture. Right? When you say that the uh uh, time for operations has to be constant. Does that mean that there should be one number of picoseconds that well, for everything, so or that, or that all the processors so take the same amount of time to add, and all the processors take the same time to multiply, but it 
the multiply time may be bigger than the add time. Yeah, so, okay, so, so this is again simplifying the model of computation. It's assuming all the processors are the same, which is not necessarily true, although in most PRAM actual systems that is true. Um, but it's assuming that adding and multiplying take the same amount of time. That's not, not necessarily true, although, so the way the architecture works is you're gonna try and pipeline all these instructions through and the time for the pipeline is the slowest instruction. Although, you know, certain things may take several steps in the pipeline in order to even them out. So it may take three times as long. You know, it's usually not more than some constant like between three and 10 of factor difference. And so that's a constant if you're using um, this big O notation that, that, that gets absorbed in the big O. Other things are more important like if you're using integers versus doubles, then doubles take maybe in order of 100 times as long. I'm not sure what the current difference is. But integer versus double operations is probably a, a larger thing to worry about than plus versus multiply. But I, again, you know, maybe those constants aren't so important in the scheme of things. But um, okay. Uh, Okay, so, so so I said that model is not as uh, as as used as as much anymore. Now, there if you if you're working with really large scale parallel algorithms, your one one way of doing it is through this message passing model, where you you think each processor has some data associated with it, and you you can do computation on your own data, and you can also send data to someone else, and then another processor can receive data, right? Um, and so th this, this can be, th just doing this completely across all processors is actually not match how the hardware works. There's often these different sorts of topologies that your processors are, um, are set up in. The most basic is this array ring topology where you think you chain them together in kind of a sequence and maybe it loops around. Um, and so there's these other mesh and hypercube topologies I'll show in a second. And so this processor can only talk to its two neighbors. It can only use send receive with its two neighbors. That makes implementing the send and receive operations a lot easier by restricting this. You have fewer things you have to check every, every so often if you have received a message from them. Um, but if I want to do a computation on here that involves data that starts out on the nodes arbitrarily, and I have p different processors, then I'm going to need at most, I mean at least um, omega p rounds to do any sort of operation. If I have things p over two processors apart, just to send it is going to take p over two rounds of operations, where I have to do a send and wait for the receive to happen and repeat that. It just takes, um, as the, on the number of, on the order of the number of processors, that much time to get it from here to here. So you're gonna have a lower bound on the amount of time to do any operation where the data is distributed. Um, so, so there's, the, there's a, the next level up is on the mesh topology, where now each node is connected to four neighbors. They put them down in this kind of this grid. And you can also loop around in, in both sides, right? So, so you know, if you're, it, it, you know, as a as a geometer, I would probably say this is more the sphere topology. Could this actually um, is is that right, or is this a yeah, it's sphere um, project? It's a sphere. Um, it's not the projective plane. No. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's this sphere topology that. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, so so so. Um, if you want to do something here, this one also has a lower bound on the on the run on the rounds. It takes square root p rounds, right? So if you're going to get across here, if there are p processors, it takes you know p times p is the mesh. So just to get from here to here, it still takes square root. P. I mean, from these two, you can actually loop around, but say halfway between. Um, so it's actually um, square root p over two. Usually, is is not too bad, but for really Large scales that use something like this hypercube topology, where you can think of labeling each of the nodes with um, you have some some power of two 
nodes and you label each of them in in binary, right? So this one is zero 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 zero, and any other node that has the the binary off by a single bit, um, you can route. You can send a message to and from those machines, right? So this is zero 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 one. It's off. That's the last bit, but it can also be the the second to last bit, or it can be the the third to last bit over here, or the fourth to last bit over here. Okay, so the, now I no longer, as P grows, I no longer have a constant number of nodes that I can, I can send stuff to. Um, this now grows uh, um, with log P, right? Because there, there are two to the P nodes, then I need log P bits to represent it, and I can send and receive to any of things off by, off by one bit. So they're log P neighbors, um, but also routing only is going to take at, you know, at least the log P number of processor steps, right? I can get, so from here to here, all the bits are different. I can do one hop down here, a hop over here, hop there, and hop there, right? So it's at most log P um, different steps here. So for really large scale, this seems to be the, 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 the you know, what, what people will, will often use on these very large scale supercomputers. Now, it may not be exactly this hypercube topology, there may be a bit more hierarchy here. You can see how I've broken this into a hierarchy of these nodes and, and these nodes and, and so forth. Um, and so it, it's, so, so you, you may actually have uh, this group being um, larger than just four nodes instead of something like that. But you can roughly think of something like this. Now, there may also be intermediate nodes which are used to, to route these things. Um, but um, otherwise, we have not too many wires. But th this is a reasonable model to, to think of for planning algorithms. Um, okay. Um, so if you want to do so, if you want to do this thing with the message passing, there's this um, there's this open MPI, which is kind of the the, um, the way of um, is kind of. The, the code infrastructure system to implement a lot of these things. And, you know, I've, so if you want to crucially, if you want to really exploit the, the, the locality of your data, like you're simulating some, um, the, so, some like weather system in the ocean or simulating the ocean, then you'll have something that actually looks like a mesh topology. The, the data for parts of the ocean will be on a machine next to other machines that have data for similar parts of the ocean. You can, you can exploit, exploit the actual locality of the data to be match the locality of your machines. Um, and then you can send stuff back and forth with this message passing model. And you can be sending stuff while you're doing computation. And, um, and you can really kind of optimize the, a lot of the most, the, 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 the highest utility and the fastest times to really squeeze out uh, the, the best runtime for the number of processors on these very complicated simulations is done using this sort of, these sorts of tools. Um, I didn't understand this example. Yeah, okay. So, so, so one kind of sort of example is you're trying to understand the flow of water in the ocean. Right? And so you need to run a simulation on, on the ocean of how the currents are flowing and you have some initial conditions on the currents, and then based on some kind of local conditions, the currents may change or move. And so, now to, in order to simulate this, you want to do it at a fine resolution. So you take your whole ocean, and you break it up into chunks. And you put each chunk of the ocean on one machine, and run a simulation there. But th that chunk of the ocean, the simulation needs to interact with the chunk next to it, right? Yes. And so you need to send messages back and forth, but if with your mesh topology, you have the right nodes next to each other. Those are the ones you need to send message back and forth to are exactly the ones that you can send data back yeah. and forth to. And so you want to be doing computation while sending as minimal messages as possible. And you know sometimes you need to wait till you get information from your neighbor before you can run the next step. And so you need to kind of try and optimize these these sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, 
That's a good question. So this is not always how they do it. Sometimes there's some parts of the, of the ocean that require more time to simulate than, than other parts. Um, and so when you're doing this, using the mesh topology and that sort of layout uh, breaking up may not be very wise because every step you're waiting for one of these chunks of the ocean to finish because it has much more complicated uh, um, dynamics going on that you need to spend longer to simulate. So, off, so sometimes you'll take the data and split it up randomly to kind of avoid this flow and not worry about the communication so much. And then if you have to route stuff further, you know, you kind of kind of deal with that. Um, so this is not always, you know, breaking it up based on the spatial locality of your simulation is not always the right way to go. Uh, it can run to some problems. But, all right. So has anybody proposed like a star topology where I, I, I'm, I'm picturing, yeah, say, Google with uh, a thousand machines in a, in a data center and the network arrangement probably allows anybody to talk to anybody with approximately equal delay. Yeah, so it's it's so, so often you'll you'll think of these models as like having a, a coordinator node or a master node, right, that's dealing with all the communication. You know, th this has advantages and uh, uh, um, also disadvantages. One of the advantages is it takes everyone two hops to get to any other node. You go up to the master and then down to the other node. Um, you know, and it's also easy because the master can control all the routing. The other, the other nodes don't need to worry about receiving messages from anyone random. They only need to worry about talking with the master. But there are two major downsides to this. One is that the, the master node, which may end up being more powerful, has to deal with all of the traffic, right? So if, if there's a lot of traffic, it, it can easily be the bottleneck there. The, the other thing is that if your master node, uh, if it crashes, you've kind, of, you've kind of lost a lot, right? It's very hard to recover if the master node crashes, the coordinator crashes. Um, whereas a lot of the other systems in, in MPI, you have to deal with a lot of these checkpoint thing for, these, when you have lots of nodes, they go down all the time. And so you, um, you can recover from one arbitrary, you know, one random node going down, but the master node going down is, is devastating. You usually have to start over. Uh, but it's only one node, so the probability of that node going down is, is you know, it's, it's still <coughs> doesn't happen as often as one of a thousand, any one of a thousand. So the, the master node would be like the network hub or something like that. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it, <coughs> if you're running MapReduce or Hadoop, you actually, you know, designate one of your nodes as, as, as the master. And, and, that's, and, and that one controls all the routing. We'll, we'll think of, we'll kind of ignore that in the, in the analysis, um, but, but that's how it's, 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 it's implemented. Yeah, but when I read the Google file system, distributed, distributed file system, yeah. the master is used only for, for example, for retrieving some keys, some important information that then gives enough information to the server, to the smaller servers. Uh, what kind of, where do they need to send data and so on? So basically, the data doesn't tra travel through the server. Yeah, yeah. It just retrieves the basic information. Yeah, so, th so that's one way of avoiding this issue of all the data routing through there. Uh, but it can help, you know, organize the routing that way. So you still have to have the backend architecture to route these things, and there's not always a direct connection between the nodes. And they end up having, sometimes the information does have to go through intermediate nodes or some sort of router on the network. But those are often separated from the actual computation. And you can often, you can ignore them. There's backend systems that, that deal with this. But that's in some of these more advanced systems. When you're dealing with, with MPI, you often have to deal with some of, a lot of these issues yourself. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of these more, uh, these, these newer systems that are, have taken a different tack than MPI. I'm mm. not saying one is better than the other. Yeah, as soon as you start talking about nodes going down, I'm, I'm picturing, okay, say, if, say we have a, a mesh thing and one node goes down, how do we get the updated routing information out to all of the other nodes so that they can route around it? So, um, so, so basically if, so typically if you could, if you knew it was out of the system, you could, you have to update a constant number of nodes routing information to fix it 
typically you'll 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 have this node do a recovery, and then you'll once it reboots itself, then you'll try and um, re redo the computation on there. And other nodes keep keep going at you know at, at the doing the computation that they can do, and wait for this one to recover. Or you may decide it's down and uh, and shift its computation someplace else. There are lots of actually messy issues you have to deal with if you're if you're thinking about these topologies. But these get the, the highest highest sort of performance. So um, there's people who, who deal with these things. I'll, I'll comment on this in a couple more more, more slides as well. Um, okay, so um, in so people are analyzing these things and there was this kind of there are people in the algorithms community who are algorithm analyzing and developing algorithms with PRAM, and then people in the architecture community were saying, you know, we, we can't, this PRAM is maybe not the right model for really large scale things. Um, and so, um, Les Valley came along in 89 and came up with this, uh, uh, um, with this, uh, um, this BSP model. So he won the, the Turing Award for this, among other things as well, he also innovations in machine learning and and you know on various other areas of computer science. But so th this is a different way of thinking about these parallel algorithms, and it proceeds very strictly in these rounds where you do um, things that are you know um, so it's bulk synchronous parallel. It means you do sync you do these synchronous uh, uh, ch um, chunks of computation. And then you, and then you wait for it to do all the non-parallel stuff, and then you do all the parallel stuff. Um, so it'll kind of look like those, those that model from, um, from Guff's um, from Guff's systems law I showed earlier. What happens? You think of each processor doing some computation on its own memory. Each CPU now has its own private memory, um, and it does a computation it can, and then you. It's some fixed amount of computation, and then says, I need data from other processors. And you have a round where all CPUs communicate with all other CPUs. Maybe this is not directly, maybe it's through some intermediate routing nodes or through coordinator, but they talk with all CPUs. They transfer uh, the, the amount of data that they need to transfer. And then you have to wait, and you don't start working again until all the data is transferred across all the CPU, all the processors. In the message passing model, as soon as you get the data you want, you can start. You can start running. Um, so and and so you can squeeze more more uh, efficiency out of this. But in the bulk synchronous parallel model, you have to wait till they're all done. So you have this barrier step where you wait till everyone's done synchronizing. Once this is done, then you do the computation again. So it very strictly enforces this, this notion of rounds. Um, it turns out that. This is much easier to, um, to implement in hardware and more closely matches, at least in the late 80s, what the hardware was doing, what the parallel uh, machines were doing then. They may have been, you may have implemented some message passing thing, but they were actually doing passing stuff in rounds. Um, they, were, they would pass stuff and then they would do computation. And this just said, let's. Let's wait till everyone's um, done sending information and then do computation. And this made it a lot easier to design algorithms as well. You no longer had to worry about, you know, was the data completely updated or not when I got it. You knew that each processor had finished what it was doing before it sent it. And the other one got all the information it needed before it started the next computation. So there's some gonna be some slowdown here, but it turns out, you know, not really that much slowdown in practice. You know, you're not going to get the full optimal runtime doing this, but it's not going to be too far off. And it's much easier to design algorithms for and for a design of hardware. Um, Doesn't it suffer from... Uh, I, I'm, I'm seeing uh, all of the message passing happens at once. So you, all of a sudden you get the message passing infrastructure being stressed out and maxed out and then it sits idle for a thousand cycles while processing happens, and then it gets stressed out again. Uh, it, it, it yeah, that's a good point. So, um, so th th this, so, so th th these ideas have been have been integrated into 
lots of modern systems like MapReduce. And for instance, in MapReduce, how you might, th this, this could be a very real issue. What you, if, when, when Google has it on their servers, they have many people running MapReduce jobs at once. So one job may be waiting uh, for the, the, the send receive phase while the other one is doing computation. So if you're doing, um, so you can break up your competition um, in, in that way. Um, so, so you're kind of pipelining it through and, and you can avoid these, these issues that way. Um, but if, if you were doing things in a vacuum, uh, um, that would definitely be very true. So it's, it's strange, like in a lot of, um, you know, a lot of academic settings, people try and isolate one thing of computation and speed it up and so they'll, they won't be running anything else on their cluster when they're doing it, you know. But that's not how things operate. You know, when when if you look at how how Amazon, um, any of you who are using the Amazon uh, web services, you can either you can either pay for a single machine which you have complete control over, or you can pay for cycles on mach some machine which is shared among other people, and it's cheaper to get a shared machine because then multiple people can use it, and it's going to be a little bit slower. But not always, you know, all, all that much so, um, because it can it can kind of the OS can kind of sort these things out. Now, if you're, and they'll they'll try and charge you by the amount of CPU time you use, um, and there are some issues with that. But most academic settings will say, I want to get the as fast as possible, so I won't run anything else. And that's not really how things are are done in practice at the most efficient. So it's it's important to keep these 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 kind of issues in mind when thinking about uh, designing algorithms and thinking about these systems. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, here, it means that uh, all these processors are uh, running, but when one of them wants uh, needs some information from other CPU, uh, everyone gets stopped until this information is created. Well, it could be that in one round, this CPU has very little to do. Um, and it's if you have 10 CPUs and one of them has very little to do, but the other nine have something to do, you wait till all nine of those are done with their computation, and then you and then you send and then you go and and get more information. Um, you try you want to try and structure what you don't want to happen is where you have a single CPU that has to do 10 times as much computation as all the others. So you have a lot of processors idle while that last one is is doing a lot of work. And we'll spend a full lecture in the MapReduce section talking about algorithms that try and deal with this, this issue, where they, they have, um, was it full lecture? I'll at least spend part of one lecture where we talk about this is called, in MapReduce, is, um, it's called the curse of the last reducer. There's one processor which has a lot of work to do and all the other ones are waiting for it. And you, do, you want to design your algorithm so that does not happen. So that that becomes an algorithms issue that you have to why you need to think carefully about these things differently than sequential algorithms, and you need to take care of how things are are bought. Uh, you are talking about a cluster, a cluster model. Uh, like if you take any open MP or any pseudo cluster model, you can uh, specify number of processes you can say. I'm running on only one CPU. And I can specify my configuration process of say hundred or thousand. How that will affect my RAM or any existing architecture? Uh, so I, I didn't quite understand the question. You say you're actually running on one yeah, CPU, one CPU, but you tell it you're running on more. Yes. Um, it's a pseudo cluster. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why you'd want to do that. It seems like it would just slow, slow your things. And now you might want to do it to try and simulate running a larger cluster, but it seems like you're only putting more restrictions on what your com your computer is allowed to do, which would run make your algorithm probably run slower. Um, so I'm not sure why you'd want to do that. Um, so you, you you could now the. So, so what is that actually going to do? Is it going to actually take all of your RAM and segment it up into small pieces for each of the processors? It might do that, or it depends on, I don't know how the compiler will work for those things. It may say, when I'm dealing with this processor, I'll bring that processor's RAM in from disk, 
and then I'll push it back to disk and get the RAM for the next processor. Um, it, it depends on how much RAM you're actually using. Um, so, I, so I'm not sure how it would be actually implemented. But um, so if you're running on a single CPU where, or a single computer with say four CPUs and one one RAM, it probably has, um, it probably looks more like the on like the shared memory stuff. And it's probably using one of those, one of those algorithms. But you know, m most cases, when you have it in your personal laptop, how this is being used is say, one CPU is running your MP3 player, right? Like listening to music. One is running the OS. One is downloading, dealing with the downloads off the web, right? And they're, they're dealing with separate kind of um, uh, programs which have been virtualized. And so they actually have private private memory, and so they're they're not dealing with the shared memory issue very much. There, there's some of it that's controlled by the OS that has to deal with this, but um, it's it, it's it's figured out how to do that even before it had multiple processors using the you know the, this goes back to, back to Windows where they figured out how to run these things, and that's most of the utility you get on your own on your own personal computer. Um, most people are not doing simulations on their personal computer. They're, they're using it for watching YouTube and listening to MP3s at the same time. So. Okay, so th there was an update to this, this, this model. He had, a, a Les Valley had another paper which I don't, has not gotten as much press, but I, I like this paper a lot, um, only a few years ago, where he realized that most systems don't look like this, where you have all these processors that can talk to each other equally, there's actually some, some hierarchy of processors. Um, and we'll, we'll look in more depth at one in particular of, and that's uh, dealing with, uh, uh, um, dealing with uh, um, GPUs. That's, that's a very many processors and a very hierarchy of certain processors can talk to other nearby ones much more efficiently than ones further away on the disk. And so you have this very, big notion of hierarchy of how the processors are structured. So you have a number of processors, but you also have, at, at every level, you can think of parallelizing your computation, right? So you have the top level maybe split four ways, and then that level is split eight different ways, and that level is split 16 different ways. Um, there are some G GPU chips from NVIDIA that actually look like this. And so at each level, you want to run a parallel algorithm. And so at each, and, and you need to worry about many different parameters here. The number of ways that the hierarchy is splitting, the, the memory of cache associated with each level of the hierarchy, the block size, this goes back to these IO efficient algorithms, the amount, the, the size that the, the, the chunk that the data is passed in, and the cost it takes to, to synchronize between these rounds. So it's, it uses, it's an extension of this bulk synchronous parallel. So it has this, there's some overhead cost of this synchronization. And each of these will vary at levels of the higher. So the lower levels have much smaller parameters in the memory block size and the synchronization cost. Um, but they'll, as, as a whole, they'll be also be very less powerful as well. Um, and so you want to design an algorithm that works in parallel at all levels of the hierarchy in this block synchronous parallel form. Um, does this all simultaneously. And to get full utilization of a GPU, for instance, you really need to worry about all these aspects to get it to be efficient at every level of the hierarchy. This is also true to a lesser extent in, say, um, if you're looking at a big cluster, say, at Google, where each machine may have um, multiple cores. They may have some 16 core machines. Um, and they may each, and uh, the, each, the, they, the cores may be grouped into, into four processors each, and each processor may have a different level of the cache. And then you would, uh, and then they'd be some on the same rack in a network and some in a, in a different different data center. There are different levels of a hierarchy. This assumes that everything is, is uniform um, at each level, which is not necessarily true at uh, some clusters, say at Google, um, but in other places this would be true. And so you can actually design so it, it analyzes things at, at all levels of the architecture together. It's like this cache oblivious, but instead of 
ignoring the block size that actually uses the block size to optimize it. These are all parameters that's for, for, for a GPU, these things are actually specified by the hardware. Um, so you can actually use these parameters to optimize your algorithm. Um, and you, you, you need to write something once abstractly and then kind of uh, have the algorithm kind of specified for each of the cores, um, for each of the levels. Um, yeah, so it's, it, it, it's got a huge number of parameters. It's part of the reason this thing get traction is that it, 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 looked, it looked really messy, but if you're really gonna analyze the system, you do actually have all of these parameters you may want to pay attention to. Um, and so, but the, the algorithms themselves turned out to be fairly simple, and they showed how to get essentially optimal level, uh, optimal algorithms at all levels of the hierarchy for basic things like matrix multiplication, fast forward transfer, and so on. So he uses here the depth parameter, right? But for example, for Google, you could use the tree, right? Everything that's within some parent, let's say a rack, yeah. everything here would have the same communication cost. And then you go from rack to some computer, all the cores have the same. Yeah. So right, basically right. it's just a little bit. Different. Yeah, so you, so you could adapt this yeah. to so Google or, or other, there are other systems. Instead there are specialized of, machines of which are built, um, you know, other ways like this as well, like, um, like David Shaw and these specialized machines built for protein folding. I don't know exactly what the architecture is, um, but it's this very specific architecture and they probably know and exploit whatever parameters it has. Um, okay, so th this kind of, th these are kind of the high level views of these things and I want to stop and pause and th 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 this is actually some notion I got from, um, from Mary Hall and there are, there are kind of two basic types of programmers in the world, and you want to kind of think to cater to both types. There's the one who wants to optimize you know, the heck out of everything, to tune all of the parameters to get it working as fast as possible. Um, so the, the, this is great, there's definitely need for these people, and, and th these people will get the best performance on things. There are also people who want to get stuff working. You know, they just want to get working, they want to get up and running, um, you know, and they, and they don't want to work too hard to do it, right? So if you look at a lot of, you know, these startups in the Bay Area, they'll use like... Oh. No, when time is a constraint. Um, uh, what? When time is a Yeah, constraint. so time is a constraint. They want to get something working quickly. They'll use like Ruby on Rails and throw everything on Hadoop on Amazon EC2, get something up and running, and not really worry about optimizing it, but they want to, but they, if they have lots of data, they need to parallelize it somehow. And you don't want to deal with all these, the level of the mutex and uh, how to, you know, all of the different parameters in the hierarchy. You don't want to deal with all those things. And so, you know, in, in the past, parallel algorithms has been dominated by these people, but what's really happened in the last 15 years is that it's become more available to the, the second type of person. And there are a lot more of these second type of people. Um, most, most people at, at Google are using these tools they have been built without really knowing you know, how it works, but they can run on huge data sets and fairly efficient um, because they have built tools for this second type of person. Even you think at Google, this is where all these type of people go. No, most people at Google are actually like this. Um, you know, there are plenty of people like this at Google and that's what makes the things actually work quickly. But, um, you know, part of it is building the infrastructure, part of it is using the infrastructure. Um, it's, that's how you split up these these things. And so, um, okay, so maybe I, well, so, so given that, MapReduce was this, this system built at Google, what was it, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I forget, um, that is meant to make it easy for the second type of person. So people can easily, do these large scale easy analysis. And um, so I'll, I'll talk much more about this when we get to this, this part of the class. So I'll give a whole other lecture, lecture on, on MapReduce and probably also some variants of MapReduce. But the, the basic idea is you think of, you can think of your data as being stored, you just have this large data set, and, but it's stored in these individual records, these key value pairs. And then you basically just give this map function which takes um, 
which, which, uh, which is going to take each of the elements and, and, and in each of the key value pairs and do something on it, right? And, and you're not going to care which processor is doing or independent of how the other one. So you can think of this large data set and you just stick processors essentially arbitrarily on it to start with. Now, what the mapper does is it takes it and it creates a new key value pair, and the key in particular is used by some sorting step, which sends it to a machine kind of, uh, or a shuffle step that sorts it based on the key. So all the things with the same key or sometimes with the similar key uh, are ensured to wind up on the same machine. So this is where you get your kind of sense of locality where you can you know, do something on, you have this data or organized arbitrarily, and now you can get the stuff that's important to work together on to all in the same location. That's done by the map step, and then once it's all in the same location, you have a different piece of code you write, which takes in, again, these simple elements, these key value pairs, and does something called a, a reduce step on them. And then, um, and then after it does this reduce step, it writes it back out to, it writes it back out to disk. Okay, so this part may actually work in a streaming sense. It may not write an intermediate to disk. It may need to buffer some things on the disk at times, um, but, but it starts on disk, it ends on disk. Um, and so, now th this is a very restricted form of, and this is one round, right? So this, this is a very restrictive form of parallel programming, but it turns out you can do a lot of things un inside of this model. Um, this is a simplified view. There's, there's, more, there's a lot more to do with the, with the back end here. Um, and you have to use these key value pairs, but a lot of these modern, really large data sets are stored this way, and they're stored kind of with some repetition using like the Google file system or Hadoop file system on disk as key value pairs. And so this is a very easy to use parallel architecture on top of it. Often the, the two pieces of code you need to write, the map step and the reduce step, are really usually very simple. They're usually just a few lines of code. And they really have to be that you, you, you have a very restricted form that your data is in, so you, it's hard to do complicated things often. Um, so it's very easy to do, and you can do operations very quickly. Um, the, the, the real... Uh, I have one question. Yeah. How can you do the sorting fast? So, so each computer has a few, some, for this key so I have this value for Yeah, this. so it's not actually doing sorting, what so it, it basically does, it, you just it, it randomly assigns keys to locations, and, and this in practice tends to balance things pretty well. Yeah, but There's some but still, extra optimizations on top But still of you need to send all the keys uh, to some computer, right? And so the, there is going to be a master node which will t take care of this, yeah. Okay, but then each computer has a key and a value, uh, some values associated with that key, right? And then some other computer may have the same key. After, so in the reduce step, all the things with the same key are on the same Yeah, key. Uh, before reduce. Yes, before reduce. Before reduce. Yes. But yeah, so I'm just asking now, okay, this one computer has key values, and then the other computer has the same key, but let's say some other values, Correct. okay? Yep. Okay, so now some random values are, are assigned to this key. Okay, they actually need to go to this machine, right? And then they both send the data to So them. it's not necessarily the same key as before. So you, you're going to get a, a new, yeah, it can be a different a new key. key after the map step, and that tells you how to, how to group things, essentially. So some, some values, some elements in the key value pair will actually be duplicated sent multiple locations. You don't want to do too much duplication, um, but you can do some limited amount of duplication. Um, so there's some analysis which talks about when you, if how much speed up can you get by a certain amount of duplication, and how much that is needed. And anyways, we'll, 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 um, we'll, we'll talk much, much more about this in, um, in a few weeks. Um, the, the real, the, the, so there, there are two things that accomplish here. One, it really simplified what was needed to be done for parallel algorithms. And also, there's a very, um, the, 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 the back end well, takes care of a lot of the business. It takes care of the sort step, all of those details. How to route it to balance things to, to some extent. Um, it can't do everything. There are some things you need to worry about, but a lot it takes care of. Also, when you deal with a lot of these, you know, somewhat cheap machines, machines crash all the time. You don't want to restart your computation. When a machine goes down, the data is, is, is stored in duplication, 
and it can recover very easily, and the programmer doesn't need to worry about that. In MPI, you may need to worry about, you may need to do checkpointing and stuff yourself. In, in, in MapReduce, you don't need to worry about that. The machines go down all the time, it, it may be a, a day or two before they actually go and reboot them. They have that many machines, that's for that much of a resource. So, um, it's, it's, so it's very simple to use, and it and it's very robust to cheap machines, and it can be very parallelized. And so it does have limitations. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention some of the extensions in another slide. Another version of parallelism is these GPUs. The, the basic idea is these were developed for graphics, where a graphics, if you don't know, is basically a soup of triangles in many cases, and you want to have a viewpoint and which triangles you see, and each pixel is drawn as a single color. And you can think of the GPU as a special purpose thing, so each pixel has its own processor, essentially. Um, and that own processor has some very simple sort of operations it can do. It can do a depth buffer, which is finding, have a bunch of things, you want to find this, this the closest one. You also have a color buffer when they have some transparency factor, you're adding these things up with some transparency. So you can essentially add and you can take the min. These were initially the only real operations that people had to work with and they started saying, this is a very specialized, very powerful thing, what can we write with this? Um, then NVIDIA um, said, cool, people are using this, let's make it easier. And they started giving a much more sort of instructions that you can do in addition to these sorts of things. But really at the heart, you still want to do operations that look kind of like this. Um, and you also need a very specified things at a very low level what you're going to do, a very fine-grained parallelism. And you need to worry about the hierarchy because this is built, it's not just a, a bunch of these independent processors, there's a hierarchy built where each processor has a very limited amount of memory, like a few registers. And on top of that, there's a group of them that have a little bit more memory. And on top of that, there's a group that have even more memory. And you need to really think about the whole hierarchy in order to optimize the sort of code. So we'll, and some things you can do on GPUs that on any other system would either cost a thousand times as much or take a hundred times as long, or maybe, maybe both. That on a GPU, you can do very cheaply and very efficiently. So there's still some things that you can do much better here than anywhere else. Um, what was the notation they're meaning? I'm, I'm seeing X, W, Oh, don't alpha. don't worry about this for now. This okay. Is, you can take the min of a bunch of things and you can add a bunch of things with weights. It's, it, it, these are not as important as they used to be. If you're doing this 10 or 15 years ago, you needed to know much more about these. Now you can basically write some fairly basic code, um, you know, anything you want, but you need to worry about the higher things. It's more important. Okay, so the, these have been developing quickly, especially extensions of, of MapReduce. MapReduce, you know, was, Google started talking about it 10, 15 years ago, but only seven or eight years ago did the research community and people outside really start caring about it. Some, it was close to uh, Google, so it wasn't really until uh, uh, um, Hadoop was written, just open source variant, that people really started using it and realizing that it had a lot of limitations. So first, Google had some more tools inside of their own system. There's things like Sawzall and Dremel, which, which are allow you to kind of do statistical things uh, where you want a very small answer, like uh, give me the average of a bunch of things, much faster than MapReduce is not well built for that. So they have different sorts of um, archive, um, tools for that. Um, there's also this very recent thing, the last couple of years out of the AMP lab at Berkeley called Spark, which is um, another um, open source, uh, I think it's a completely open source version of, version of Hadoop or of MapReduce. It's essentially doing the same sort of things, but it's doing much more in memory. It's thinking much more about these IO efficient algorithms and how it's implementing things. Um, they, you need some certain ideas to figure out how to do this, but um, it's, it's not a trivial thing to do, that's why it took so long for some very smart people to actually do this, but it's, it can be much faster, especially on iterative algorithms that need lots of rounds. And these are important in machine learning and certain types of SQL type, type queries that you want to do. Um, so, so this, I think, is really a, a, a big breakthrough. 
and will kind of really change how how people do a lot of computation. And, um, this 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 it's still r rough around the edges than um, than Hadoop, but it can show like forty times speed up. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, up till how long is it on the Spark version of? How, how long what? Yeah, how long is the Spark version of? How long is I think the paper was. It's pretty new, right? It was a 2011. Is, is that when the paper came out? What? 2010. 2010. Yeah, so it's it's pretty new. Uh, yeah. But the the code, I think, when they first released had the paper, it was still a prototype they version. They integrated it in Apache, I think, last year. Yes. Okay. So it's pretty new. So it's really really. Yeah, I know new. that it's going in Apache. Yeah, but I the thing is that it's implemented in Java. Yeah. Scala. Yeah. Well, Scala. So it's Scala. JDF. So so Hadoop was also in Java. Um, so maybe there's room for speed up, but you have to get it get it working first. Yeah. You know, one thing that uh, Mary Hall said is that um, these systems, your your bottleneck is usually uh, your I/O. So yeah. if you do something on top of it, like using Java and C plus plus or C, well, you know your, your bottlenecks, your I/O stuff. Yeah. With Spark, you know, it's, it's a little different because a lot of the, the uh, you're doing a lot of stuff in memory, but you still have a lot of IOs that you have to pull the data up, and then you have to cache data periodically or something. Yeah. So, so the difference between Java and C should not be too big for these sorts of operations. It's more the IO cost. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, you, maybe you could do a different implementation that would be a little bit faster, but it's not going to be 40 times faster. Then, which is the speed up this guy. This probably squeezed a, a lot of the speed up you could get out of these sort of things. Um, so, and then the, the last thing we will uh, hopefully be able to give a talk on is these more um, kind of a, a more unorganized ways of parallelism, um, where you have lots of machines on s connected in some way. This is involves a variety of different things. If you think of using um, uh, um, of using BitTorrent. You know, this is really some large parallel processing. And there's this innovation called this distributed hash table, which is this way of dealing with this. These needs to be much more um, resilient than MapReduce. Machines go in and out and have very different speeds and, and you know, their communication will fall out all the time. Um, and so you have to be much more resilient to things going down um, and things and new machines coming on all the time. So we'll talk about this. Um, th there's also these things like the SETI at home or the, the folding at home. And I don't know if this is still true, but two years ago when I looked all this up, the, you know, the, the, the SETI at home was actually, by my calculations, was actually the largest um, uh, um, computing cluster out there at the time. This, this may not be as true anymore. But these are massive arrays of machines. Um, but they have very restricted models of how they actually operate. Um, so how would, how would you harness this sort of thing? And then finally, so Twitter and Facebook have their versions of MapReduce type systems, but they have, their main computation has to be much more uh, um, dynamic than what MapReduce is built for. Twi you get tweets, you want to immediately show up on lots of people's feeds. Um, how do you how, how do you do this? They what they do is they build a MapReduce like system, but it uses it's built kind of on top of a distributed hash table instead of kind of a fixed cluster of machines. Um, and this allows them to do something in between MapReduce and streaming. Um, and there's some cool aspects of these systems as well. So we'll hopefully we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, so so okay. So this is the overview. Um, so, so sorry. I, Ran over time again. Um, so the the schedule looks like I'll do some basic parallel stuff, and then we'll start MapReduce, and then I have a few lectures on s GPUs, and then some um, kind of uh, more of these unordered distributed computing sections. Um, if people really want to hear about one thing and not so interested in another, um, I'd be I'd be happy to change this. Last yeah. year there were several GPU people in the class, so I may have. But Let's talk much. more about MapReduce and Spark than Parallel. On, on what? On distributed. Yeah. Distributed computing. Yeah. Um, you have to do MapReduce and Beyond. Yeah. So is anyone interested in, in GPUs? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, so and 
parallel is likely to come up heavily in my research. Okay. Yeah, so, so I'll definitely do the parallel. This is kind of the basis for, for things. This is still background. This is modern systems after, after this function. So th th these are all kind of the foundation, and then I can talk about more modern things. After I've done this. If, if we need tons more detail, would it be feasible to just extend this lecture into next semester? <laughs> well, um,